Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Gents. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. Welcome to episode 181 of the Garden DC podcast. In this episode, we talk with Maddie Hoagland Hansen, horticulturist with Casey Trees, all about invasive plants. The plant profile is on Adonis amurensis, and we share what's going on in the garden, as well as some upcoming local gardening events and garden tasks in the What's New segment. We close out with a last word on composting with Paul the Possum, by Christy Page of Green Prince. This episode, we're joined by Maddie Hoagland Hansen. She is a horticulturist with Casey Trees based in Washington, D.C., and we're going to talk to her all about invasive plants. Welcome, Maddie. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to chat with you about this. Very close to my heart. Yay, I'm so glad you're here. And uh, I've been wanting to have somebody from Casey Trees on the podcast for a while because I know what wonderful work that organization does for Washington, D.C. and the surrounding area. But before we get into that and dive into our topic of invasives, I wanted to ask you, were you born with chlorophyll in your veins and a green thumb? Um, I Yeah, I, I guess I would have to say not exactly. I grew up in uh, really like the heart of Philadelphia, so I was very much a city kid. Um, but I've always had a real um, sensitivity to nature. So I have very early memories of being in, you know, my entire, almost entirely paved backyard and like picking up bugs, you know, like ants and, you know, slugs and little creatures and kind of like letting them crawl on my arms. You know, I was very fascinated by, you know, pigeons. It was like very, I, I was very sensitive to nature, but I, the nature that I was in contact with most often was, you know, very urban. My dad would kind of do a little bit of gardening in the backyard and, you know, the things that we planted were very much, you know, not native plants. It was like portulaca and, you know, four o'clocks and morning glories. But I have a very strong memory too of the four o'clocks in our front bed um, on the street. One night when I was like, I don't know, maybe like seven years old or something, I have this memory of like a hummingbird coming to the four o'clocks and just thinking that that was the most magical thing I had ever seen. So I would say, I, I don't think I was like, you know, born to be a gardener or like born into the garden per se, but mm -hmm. I've definitely always had um, sort of like an innate draw to the natural world, even in like growing up in a very urban place. So hmm. yeah, I have a funny story to tell uh, once we get into our conversation about invasive plants because, <laughs> um, you know, I have a very strong early memory and experience with one particular invasive plant that I'm sure your listeners will be familiar with. So hmm. I can't wait to hear about that, <laughs> um, but tracing your career journey to getting to Casey Trees, did you uh, major or pursue a plant degree or how did you go about it? Yeah, so um, actually in college I was an English major um, and my area of interest was um, romantic poetry. I don't know how familiar <laughs> um, your listeners will be with, you know, English literature, but romantic poetry um, during that historic period uh, was very much like a reaction to the Industrial Revolution and kind of, it was like a movement to kind of get back to nature, but it was like very early, you know, in the 1800s. Um, mm -hmm. So that was kind of my focus in school. And I also... I had like an environmental studies minor. And then when I graduated, I truly had no direction whatsoever as most English majors or many, I guess, of us discover. But I knew that I wanted to work uh, outdoors and I, I basically had no experience doing this whatsoever. So I ended up joining Conservation Corps um, in Texas called the Texas Conservation Corps. And I, I was part of a, the only trail crew uh, in all of Texas because Texas actually doesn't have a ton of public land, unlike other uh, states in the West. Um, a lot of the 
land in Texas is private. It's a lot of ranch land. Um, mm. So I worked um, on one of the only trail crews in the state and we would go around to like different state parks and build trails. And I really loved that. I loved working outside. Um, I learned so much. I had never really lived outside of the Philadelphia area. So I got a lot of exposure to like a totally different climate, totally different plants. And like Texas is such an interesting place. It's huge. So there's like a lot of different habitats within this like one state. And I got to travel all over um, while I was doing this work. And after my term of service was done in Texas, I actually moved to Utah and did the same thing. And there was a period of time in Utah when I was actually leading um, a chainsaw crew that was removing um, invasive autumn olive in the Escalante River headwaters. So I had a, I have a lot of very hands-on experience with um, invasive removal. Um, we were basically like, you know, coming in with chainsaws and kind of girdling these trees and then painting the stumps because in that, you know, part of, of Utah, there's like a, a problem with um, the autumn olive growing extremely thickly and kind of choking out mm -hmm. the more... I don't know, endemic species there. And then after I lived in Utah, I actually moved to Seattle and did the exact same thing. I worked for another conservation corps. Um, so I've had exposure to a lot of different natural uh, environments, at least within the, the U.S., a lot of different eco regions, I guess you could say. And that my experience working on conservation corps and actually doing like invasive species removal work was what prompted me eventually to go back to school for landscape architecture, um, partially because I felt like I wanted to be more involved in the planning process related to natural areas. Um, you know, when I uh, graduated from landscape architecture school, not not so long ago, I, I first was working for a couple of um, private landscape firms in, in here in DC. And I, I did that for about three years. And then I, I came to Casey Trees because I wanted to do a more public oriented work and I wanted to work outside more and kind of get my hands back in the dirt. So that's kind of my story. Excellent. Well, fascinating. And yeah, I'm familiar with some of the um, land out in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah area and mm -hmm. Texas. And that's not easy to work outside in <laughs> a lot of time of the year. That's that kind of brutal out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, we would we would also I mean, I was actually living up in um, Logan, Utah, which is actually in the north of the state, um, like closer to Idaho. And sometimes towards the end of the season, there would be full on snow on the ground. So it would be very, very cold. Mm -hmm. So now we've caught up to where you are now with Casey Trees. Can you talk a little bit about Casey Trees' mission and what it does and then your um, role in that? And I know Casey Trees is a well-known nonprofit to those in the Washington, D.C. area, but our listeners outside this area might not be as familiar with it. Sure, yeah. Um, so Casey Trees is um, um, a tree nonprofit. So we were founded in 2001, um, and our mission is to restore, protect, and enhance the tree canopy of the nation's capital. So uh, we do that in a lot of different ways. We have a lot of different departments that are all working on this mission. Um, probably the one that most listeners are familiar with, if they know us, is our tree planting program. So we have a lot of different grants that allow us to plant trees for free in D.C. and sometimes in surrounding um, counties like Prince George's County. And we also have a policy and land conservation team that does a lot of um, advocacy work with the city, and they also have an easement program where they try to conserve existing patches of forest within the city. And we have an education department that does a lot of work with uh, public schools in the city, um, kind of teaching them about trees and uh, doing tree planting events with them. We also have a farm out in Berryville, Virginia, where we grow a lot of the trees that we plant. So we are kind of like a one-stop shop for urban forestry in DC. Hmm. And I know you do a lot of outreach with other nonprofits and work together hand in hand with them. Like you might coordinate a uh, tree planting with another volunteer group. Yes. So, I mean, we do a ton of volunteer events throughout the city and people often get in touch with us and want to work with us, want to plant trees in a certain uh, area. Like they want to plant trees um, 
you know, near a community garden or something like that. So yeah, we work a lot with um, groups of volunteers throughout the city. Hmm. And as a horticulturist, what do you do with Casey trees? So my um, job, I guess, kind of arose uh, sort of naturally from our tree planting programs. Um, We do a lot of residential tree planting, and we were noticing that a lot of homeowners uh, wanted to also add, you know, a garden to their landscape, especially uh, something like a rain garden that would help with, you know, stormwater and add like additional ecological benefits to their yard. Um, And before I was hired, we didn't really have anyone on staff who could kind of uh, field those requests. So that's kind of been my role is to sort of complement our tree planting uh, operations with this additional layer of horticultural expertise, I guess you could say. And we we actually, so we design um, our gardens and then we also install them. So we, we're kind of like doing the whole thing from soup to nuts. Hmm. So um, let's dive into our topic of the show, which is invasive plants. And you consult some with homeowners about invasives in your role. Is that correct? Um, I mean, it does depend on the project. But yes, uh, sometimes when I come onto a site, there will be any number of uh, very hard to remove invasives or, you know, whatever it may be. And I do sometimes sort of advise homeowners on like the best way forward if they if they want to replace whatever's there with a native garden. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start our conversation off with those invasives that are more particular to the home gardener that might be fine found in your own home garden versus those invasives that might be affecting parklands or wild areas. And maybe if we have time at the end, we'll go into some more of those. But in our, I guess we'll call it a top 10 or so hit list, uh, we're going to start off with Vinca. So Vinca is a introduced plant. It's used as a ground cover, has, is also known as periwinkle, has those cute little blue purple flowers. And why don't we want that in our garden, Maddie? Um, I mean, some people do want it in their gardens, to be fair. But in, if I am coming to a site because I, I want to install more native species, I don't want to see vinca. Um, and a lot of the invasive plants that we're going to talk about are plants that, well, first of all, they're plants that very frequently um, were planted as ornamentals in the past before people kind of realized that they had what we might call invasive um, qualities. Um, So the qualities that these plants have typically are they're very fast growers. They're very difficult to remove. They usually have like an extremely tenacious um, root system. And oftentimes when you go to pull um, one of these plants, it will kind of, the the root will kind of break off and that root segment alone will be able to regenerate the the rest of the plant. Um, Usually these plants are very uh, quick at reproduction and that they use multiple modes of reproduction. So they often um, will be rhizonomous. So they'll reproduce by the root and they'll reproduce by something like seed. So they they have a, a lot of like tools in their arsenal in order to spread. They often make a lot of seeds and have like a very um, efficient dispersal technique. Like for example, you know something like multiflora rose, where it produces a very tasty little rose hip that the birds want to eat, and then it gets dispersed that way. And a lot of these plants also, speaking of vinca in particular, they have a very short or basically no dormancy period. So. A lot of these plants, such as vinca, they are green all year round. So in, for example, our native um, eastern woodlands, there's a ground story, ground layer that tends to go completely dormant over the winter. And then there's a spring ephemeral layer that comes up in the spring. These plants, they tend to colonize that ground layer and they don't go dormant at all. They just stay green and they completely smother that that early ephemeral layer that is so characteristic of like an Eastern woodland. So that's like a very long answer to your question, but Mm -hmm. that's kind of what makes these plants quote unquote invasive as opposed to just, you know, like a weed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I mean, there's some like debate or overlap between what's invasive and what is a weed, but um, there's some also some, you know, 
things that I would call weeds because they are something that I can just easily pull. Um, and it's not a problem. It might pop up, but it's not something to get upset about per se. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I would say that, you know, a step further in defining something as invasive is that it, it misplaces or replaces or takes over something else in the habitat, na native habitat, mm -hmm. right? So it's pushing something else out. So you could have a super successful plant, which, you know, basically what you described as all those invasive attributes would be, you know, your dream garden plant. <laughs> it's right. super, super successful, does great, evergreen probably, promiscuous, and but takes over, but then it does it to the nth degree. So when it crosses that line right. from weed yep. into invasive. Yep, exactly. And so I hear people, you know, we will use interchangeable terms like aggressive, fast spreader, and those could be a applied to a lot of plants. But um, also we can talk a little bit about the native versus non-native part of this uh, formula mm -hmm. in that uh, technically if it's native, it can't be invasive, but it can certainly be a super spreader, even if it's a native plant. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think a, another way of putting all of those characteristics that I was talking about, another way of saying that is like a lot of these quote unquote invasive plants are plants that thrive on disturbance and it doesn't need to be human disturbance. It can be you know, a tree falling in a forest, um, that's a form of disturbance. And the, the type of plant that colonizes that kind of disturbed area can be a native plant that has like early successional traits, you know, so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be like a, a native plant can be early successional and thrive on disturbance and not be, like you said, an invasive mm -hmm. um, and then you hear, um, because we're humans and we like to, you know, anthropomorphize everything. <laughs> so we'll talk about plants having evil tendencies or being bad plants. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I like to kind of preface discussions about invasive species with just kind of like an understanding that it, the, the plant is, is sort of a neutral actor. Um, and I, I personally think that gardening as a practice should be something that helps us cultivate empathy towards pretty much everything, definitely the natural world, like hopefully each other. Um, and just realizing that we're not like waging a war with uh, the natural world, like these plants serve an important function and are, are filling that niche. Like if we don't want them in a particular area, like that's a sort of a separate question, but they are not, um, you know, a attacking us. I, I thought it would be really interesting, actually, um, to do a little bit of research into which of our American plants are invasive in other countries. And there, it's sort of like an amazing list. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's more than this, but our black cherry uh, oh, yeah. tree is invasive mm -hmm. in Europe. Um, prickly pear is invasive in Australia. Black locust is, I mean, a lot of people say it's borderline invasive here, but it's very invasive in Hungary. Um, skunk cabbage, apparently, is very invasive in the, the UK and Europe. And this is a funny one. Lance leaf coreopsis mm. is extremely invasive in Japan. So, mm. you know, this is kind of like one of those things where it can be a hot button issue because it, it brings up this kind of feeling of or a fear of sort of what is foreign mm -hmm. um but i really think like this is certainly like one of those areas where it's a, actually a relatively new science this sort of like science of invasive species and when we talk about it like i i want to bring a lot of like nuance to to that discussion mm -hmm. um I agree. And I would say, you know, the books that I've read recently in the new research and things like the rambunctious garden, mm -hmm. you know, there's a spectrum. It goes from the theories of chlorophyll is chlorophyll. If it's green, it's good right. type of thought. You know, at least it's filling in a space and it's not concrete. It goes from mm -hmm. that to, you know, no, if it's not native, it shouldn't be here all the way over to the xenophobic side that you were alluding to. Yeah. Um, and especially a lot of these Asian plants that are considered invasive um, that were introduced as ornamental plants in the garden. Right. Yeah. And sometimes I think of it like 
you know, we see these plants pop up in areas that are extremely disturbed, like seeing, you know, an ailanthus, like a tree of heaven Mm -hmm. coming up in like the crack of a sidewalk or the crack in a, in a parking lot. And in a way, maybe there's like a feeling that these plants are kind of reflecting back at us our environmental, Mm -hmm. for lack of a better word, like sins, you know, and that's like part of this feeling of, oh, the plants are attacking (laughs) <laughs> us you know um but you know they're they're not they're just living they're just mm-hmm. living out their lives um yep. yeah and it's so easy to fall into that battle type um uh terminology just because i was a weed warrior for several years with montgomery county maryland and you know when you're out there hacking at the bottom of english ivy growing up <laughs> trees it does start to feel like a battle between yes. you and it after a while but again totally you know totally we're, and we're putting our own layer of feelings on top of it yeah and i mm-hmm. i mean this might be a good time to to tell the story that i alluded oh, yeah. to earlier about um like an invasive plant that played a big role in my early life um mm-hmm. when when i was growing up we lived on a block that had absolutely no trees it was completely treeless 100 percent, and my family was, we were the first people on the block to plant a tree. And it's so funny because I didn't realize this until quite recently, but the tree that we planted, which was one of the trees that like the city of Philadelphia like offered to us to plant in front of our house, uh, was a calorie pear. And they, you know, I think not knowing one way or the other, we wanted Mm -hmm. a tree that was flowering and you know, fast growing and all of these characteristics. We're like, we, I had no idea, you know, that that was an invasive tree. You know, I think like some of these things, they seem so terrible and so evil now, but the reality is like a lot of these plants, like no one had any idea that this was going to, you know, invade the woodlands until it started happening. You know, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. So it is kind of a, a, a tragedy in that way you know Mm -hmm. because it's like it's it's very um intractable uh Mm -hmm. at this point yeah and it's a matter of cleaning up and just trying to do better for the future you know apologize and move on (laughs) type of thing so let's um circle back to vinca the first invasive we started with and maybe talk about some techniques should you want to remove it because vinca is pretty wiry um and tough to pull so what do you recommend maddie um well it definitely depends on the situation so i mean you can this is going to probably be true of like pretty much everything that we talk about you can hand pull and you just have to be prepared to do it over and over and over again it's obviously best to hand pull when there's when the soil is pretty damp um not like wet but pretty damp and yeah, I mean, that that's generally like if, if someone wants to remove vinca and they don't want to use herbicide, I generally say you should hand pull. There's always pretty much always the option of spraying these things. A lot of people have kind of a negative reaction to needing to spray, but you know, it's it's one option that exists for things where, for example, you, you were on a slope or something and you don't want to repeatedly disturb the soil by digging. Pretty much the only option at that point is going to be to apply some kind of herbicide. Um, with something like vinca, because it has a very waxy uh, cuticle on the leaf, it, it, it doesn't take herbicide as well. So that also is going to require like multiple applications. So it's pretty tenacious mm. uh, and definitely not one that I would recommend planting if you don't already have vinca in your yard. Mm -hmm. What do you think about um, some type of some of the smothering techniques, like either cover it with cardboard or black plastic or something else uh, about a patch of it that would just, you know, kill it? If you have, you know, a lot of time, (laughs) (laughs) then you definitely can. You know, any plant can be smothered because they need light, they need the water photosynthesis yeah. they need to be able to do they need to be able to make food so i i think pretty much any plant i mean you can you can either smother it or solarize it um i don't think i have any personal experience doing that because a lot of the projects that we do are kind of on a tighter mm-hmm. timeline um but if you have the time to you know go through a full growing season and smother uh that's definitely like something to try mm-hmm. yeah i'm picturing like the homeowner who buys uh, new to them home 
but probably established, but weedy backyard. And they're just trying to get rid of, you know, all the invasives that are there, um, that they might do something like that. But I do worry sometimes with the smothering or solarizing techniques that it, it could damage the first couple inches of soil or the mm-hmm. microbial organisms that are in that first couple of inches. Maybe yeah. you're sacrificing them as well. Yeah, that's also something to think about. Like I, I've definitely um, done some smothering projects where you kind of peel off the the plastic and it's it's just very, very, you know, dry and, you know, very dusty under there and it kind of doesn't seem like a living soil anymore. So, I mean, yeah, that is something to be aware of that. I, I mean, maybe even you might have to do a little amendment after you after you pull the plastic off. Okay, let's move on to our next invasive on the list, and that's the Japanese Pachysandra, as opposed to our native in this area, the Pachysandra procumbens, our native Pachysandra. Yeah, I mean, this one I see a lot. I mean, I see. I think I see these for the same reason as the the uh, vinca. They were just planted because they do very well in dry shade, which is mm-hmm. like a condition that a lot of people have. Um, and they have no idea what to do with dry shade. And this, both Vinca and Pachysandra, they bloom and they're pretty much happy with absolutely no care. So, and I would say for both of these, I, I would say management or eradication, if you want to say techniques, are, are pretty much the same for both. Uh, they have a very similar tenacity in terms of their roots. So, like hand pulling is not super easy. Um, mm-hmm. And you can try, you know either smothering or herbicide. A lot of these invasives, honestly, a lot of these very tough kind of urban uh, warrior kind of plants, like the, uh, the the technique for getting rid of them is like very similar. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And I would say with the Japanese Pachysandra, you know, you could mow over the top to deprive it of chlorophyll mm-hmm. and maybe even do that repeatedly a few times. Like every time it tries to come up, of course, you're going to still have the underground stems and roots. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would think, you know, yeah. something like that, you could do the repeated just hacking it back until it stops coming back. Yep. Uh, yep. I mean, that's point. kind of a tried and true method too. like a lot, a lot of plants. If you just have the time and the energy to just keep cutting it like and it can't grow any leaves like it it's not going to be able to sustain root so mm-hmm. yep yep and if you have like a weed whacker or a, a good uh, mower to do that that might be the easiest way to do it um, so let's move on to english ivy we already alluded to that one <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, let's talk about the phases of life of english ivy so you know you might have been planted as a ground cover Um, Mm -hmm. and creates a thick carpet and then it starts to grow up a tree and then it gets to its mature uh, plant size and shape which totally changes the English ivy. Mm -hmm. Yeah I mean that so ivy needs to be at a certain height I'm actually not sure what the Mm -hmm. specific height is you might know. It's usually about eight to ten feet once it gets above kind of above your head above your reach that's when it For, starts to form the heart shaped leaves like it goes mm-hmm. from that ivy shape to a like it's actually very attractive if you think about it but I know <laughs> <laughs> I know I know saying it's pretty and uh-huh. then it goes to flower and forms kind of like those dark berries yep mm-hmm. yeah and I've actually I feel like at some point I've read that the flowers are actually very attractive to pollinators mm-hmm. so um they are I've seen you know it covered in bees and then the birds come and of course eat the berries Mm -hmm. and they love them too. Um, but of course they love them too much because then they, um, drop the berries, you know, after they eat them and it passes through their system, then the seeds are pretty much everywhere at that point. Mm -hmm. Yep. So So how do we stop, uh, the English ivy from going up the tree? So ivy is one that the most effective technique is probably to hand pull. And so once it starts going up a tree, as, as most people have probably seen, it starts to develop this very like woody stem. And usually you can just go ahead and cut that stem, cut like a little window out of it. Mm-hmm. And at that point, the part of the vine that's like north of that cut will just wither up and die. And you should never pull ivy out of a tree because it can, first of all, if there's any dead limbs up there, you could pull that down uh, on yourself. Mm-hmm. But also, mm-hmm. it, it the way that it um, kind of suckers to the bark 
you can end up pulling pieces of the bark off the tree and like opening up a a possible uh, root for some kind of infection. So it's really better to just like once you cut it, just like make a very surgical cut and then just let the, that that part that's up in the canopy die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen people pull down ivy and then um, like an insect nest rain down on them. Mm. Never fun. Yeah, that's exciting. <laughs> and other thing I would say, caution that I learned in Weed Warriors is, you know, ivy has this kind of like really little red hairs along the stem, similar to poison ivy, hmm. but, you know, not as many people react to it, but still you can get a contact dermatitis. Um, so definitely wear gloves when mm-hmm. you're working around the English ivy, yep. even if you're just pulling it up from the ground, even if you're not just, you know, working in the tree and cutting it. So let's move on to, um, let's jump to honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle. So of course we have our native honeysuckle. Um, that's a little bit different. So let's talk about the Asian honeysuckles that are, um, pretty much the only thing that's green Maddie. When I look into Rock Creek park this week and I'm looking straight Mm -hmm. through the under story, I'm Mm -hmm. like, "Hmm, that green over there is bush honeysuckle. That green over there is bush honeysuckle. So that's pretty much what I'm seeing at this time of year. Yeah. It's an amazing, prolific plant. I see it absolutely everywhere. The only upside, if you will, of of bush honeysuckle is that the root system is not particularly deep. So if you have, um, you know, like a weed wrench, it's not that hard to pull it out by the root. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, I guess, if you are trying to remove it, that's one way to do it. That does cause like a decent amount of soil disturbance. So another way would be to cut it and paint it with herbicide. And bush honeysuckle is just everywhere. So it's it's one of these ones where it's like, and, and I, I sh- probably should have said this earlier, but I do feel like when it comes to removing invasives, I always think have a plan for what is going to happen with that space once the invasives are removed. Because if you don't have a plan and you just plan to now get up and leave, all that's going to happen is that the invasives will c- come back. <laughs> that's so. so true and i would say yeah that's a lot of frustration of you know like weed warrior groups and other volunteer groups and you go and you clear a part you know from a local park or or wild land and then you come back a half year later and it's even worse like yeah. <laughs> everything's come roaring mm-hmm. back and you feel like all your work was for naught right um, but yeah pl- having something to plant immediately in the space to take it up and combat whatever you yeah. just Uh, removed is you know excellent advice yeah and I think I mean the reality is like we live in this world where you know there aren't enough economic incentives to care for a lot of our natural spaces so you know we we're in the system that creates these habitats that are very vulnerable to being invaded by by invasive plants and and to take care of that problem requires a lot of time and effort which is you know that's like money. So it's a mm-hmm. very, it's very hard to take care of these issues in a very long-term way. Mm-hmm. And then I just wanted to, when you were talking about cutting back uh, the bush honeysuckle and applying the her- herbicide, so you're going to do that to the open wound of the cut correctly? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's because mm-hmm. obviously painting the side of the trunk isn't going to do much. <laughs> I just want to clarify for those listeners that you're probably using a paintbrush like one of those foam craft brushes or something Mm -hmm. like that to target just the cut on the stump and then that way you're not affecting any of the surrounding plants either right yes so that that's just a way of like avoiding um herbicide drifting onto Mm -hmm. anything else and keeping it very targeted to what you're trying to take care of Mm -hmm. and of course wear gloves eye protection that sort of thing as well for safety there too um so let's talk next about porcelain berry and what a beautiful name that is maddie (laughs) i mean it was mm -hmm. it was brought as an ornamental because people Mm -hmm. thought it was very beautiful those like very beautiful blue berries are so Mm -hmm. you know yeah enticing (laughs) and the birds love it so much so Mm -hmm. it pops up all over my garden just because um the birds are bringing in the seeds um Mm -hmm. when they sit in a brush you know, they sit in a shrub and Mm -hmm. then they drop the seeds below it. So the porcelain berry vine comes up inside the shrub. Um, So (laughs) you really have to look for it. So uh, what would be your advice there, Maddie? So, I mean, this is like a really tough one. 
I would hand pull uh, as much as possible. And for some of these, like, I, I think just being able to hand pull it before it goes to seed mm. is probably enough. Like, in my opinion, some of these plants, you're never going to get rid of <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, but you're like never going to get rid of it. But if you pull it before it goes to seed, then at least you're taking care of it and won't multiply. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know if you have uh, other other tips uh, from your perspective as a former or current weed warrior. Yeah, yeah, I had retired from the weed warrior, so other people are <laughs> taking over my slots. Um, but I was going to say with the porcelainberry, yeah, you're right that you know just trying to get the the seed heads before they mature on a lot of these invasive weeds we're talking about is good advice because you know we only have so much time in a day mm -hmm. and so many resources. And if you're combating all these invasives on your property, um, if you can at least get ahead of the, that, the weed seed production. So, you know, chopping off any of the blooms, you know, right after can at least help you in the future, even if you can't yep. tackle that whole plant at that time. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think people sometimes feel bad because like they go to pull something and they just accidentally, you know, they pull it and like the root stays in there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just like mowing, you know, pulling is just mowing, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically, mm -hmm. with mowing with your hands. Um, so if you, you know, if you do that enough times, you're going to eventually weaken the root. So I would say, you know, if it's, for example, like your example, it's in another shrub and you can't really get to the, the base of it, if you just keep pulling it, like, mm -hmm. over time, hopefully yeah. that will have an effect. Mm -hmm. And just cutting it as close to the ground as you can possibly get to. Yeah. So the next is the one that everybody cringes over and maybe even has lost people out on a home sale or two, um, which is bamboo. Oh, I yeah, would say yeah. that's a non-starter for me. If I was looking <laughs> at a home to purchase and it had a swath of bamboo in the backyard, I would walk away. <laughs> Yeah, this one is very hard and it's um it it, it is everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere. So, it de it depends on the context, but one technique that I have heard recommended is to just repeatedly mow. Mm -hmm. But I mean again, this is one of those things where it's like how long do you have to take mm -hmm. care of this problem? I've I've also heard cut something like 18 inches 2 feet from the ground allow some regrowth, and then spray with herbicide. Mm -hmm. um, and another really extreme solution, depending on where you are, is to dig up the rhizome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, but this could involve a bulldozer. Like, I have yep. no idea. <laughs> like, in most yeah. situations, you're not going to be able to take care of it by digging up these very tenacious rhizomes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, unless you can rent a backhoe and, you know, get it all. You know, right. It's a it's a basically a running grass. And so, like you said, if you can just mow that edge or stop it at that certain point, you can stop its spread. You're not probably going to get too far back into the already established clump. That's mm -hmm. going to be the hard part. Yep. Yep. And I've seen, you know, stands of bamboo in the city where pitch black underneath this bamboo so it grows i mean it grows incredibly densely together it's just like an, a kind of an amazing plant um mm -hmm. but also you know from a certain perspective a little bit scary <laughs> <laughs> and then you know you can eat you know fresh bamboo sprouts yeah. you know eat your weeds yeah. and there's always all the garden uses of bamboo poles yep. so mm -hmm. dried ones and then i do hear i don't know if i've seen it too often in this area but bamboo has a life cycle. Um, so people have complained about bamboo all of a sudden dying, like a whole patch after 20 years just mm. dies back at once because it has this life cycle. Um, so you can just cross your fingers that that's coming up yeah. fast. And then, you can just outlive it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and try to get rid of it at that point. And then you could always go on something like free cycle or buy nothing and say, hey, I got a lot of bamboo poles for every, for everybody who wants one. Right, um. yeah. It used to be that we had we had those um, pandas at the zoo, but mm -hmm. not they, anymore, they, sadly. Not anymore, and they weren't eating enough <laughs> for, for all the bamboo in the right. area. <laughs> Some of the bamboo. All right, let's talk about a plant that I have introduced to my garden, to my regret, and that's sweet autumn clematis. Mm. Um, so that was sold in 
local nurseries and garden centers and touted as, you know, a beautiful yeah. clematis. And it is it does have a beautiful sweet fragrance yep. full of white flowers in the early fall, but it is a prolific reseeder. I mean, this it's funny. Yeah, so many of these plants actually you can still buy at nurseries. Some nurseries are still selling English ivy. So, you know, it's kind of amazing that, I mean, I could have an amazing business selling English ivy. Um <laughs> But I would never, I would, I would never do that. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I think for clematis, um, it is one that I see a lot that that has been purposefully planted because it is really beautiful and it does have a really nice smell. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it's one of it's one of these ones where you just have to yank it at the base. I'm sure you could also spray, but I don't really see the point in the case mm-hmm. of this vine. I would just mm-hmm. yank it over and over again um, and try to get the root. Yeah, I would say wherever you, you'll start to really recognize the little seedlings mm-hmm. in spring and where it's reseeded and just, you know, grub it out wherever you see it. Yep. And um, and I think it's, is is it, is it this uh, plant that's, the common name is also old man's beard? And it, yeah, it's also, it has a kind of a native lookalike, uh, virgin's bower clematis. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you want to know the difference and maybe you know, Google online, the Virgin's Bower version, it's a little bit more demure, blooms a little bit different time, still similar sweet smelling white flowers. But, you know, if, if it, if you see it everywhere, it's pretty much a sweet autumn clematis. Yeah. Yeah. I would say most of the time, if, especially if you're in an area that is the edge of a woodland in an urban area and you see this, like this is probably not a beautiful native plant. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause there's, you know, so many of the ones we're talking about there, that Asian counterpart has a native counterpart here. Um, mm-hmm. because at one point the continents were together and, <laughs> and maybe pre ice age, we were sharing a lot of the same, uh, plant genetics and plant families. Yeah. But, ex- yeah, yeah. I was actually thinking about that too, because, um, you know, a lot of our invasives are from China and Japan and, and a lot of their invasives are from America. And I think it just has to do with like similar climates mm-hmm. and we yep. just are, you know, passing things back and forth. Mm-hmm. And similar growing zones, and also because it's it's recent, you know, I feel like also some right. of this will settle out, uh, all, right. you know, in fifty years or so, um, everything will fight its battle and kind of settle out and back into its place. Some of it, um, but some of these introductions are fairly new, like the um, uh, sweet autumn clematis. That's pretty much in the last twenty years that that's happened. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I, I, it'll be interesting because, you know, like climate change is also happening. So like everything is kind of in like a state of flux. Um, And obviously you have global trade, which is also just like mixing this pot. So, you know, Mm. it's, it's always, always changing. It's best not to get too attached (laughs) to the way that things are. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's part of the fun of gardening too. It's mm -hmm. always changing. It's always an experiment. Um, so as we sum up um, our session today, maybe let's talk about some of the invasives that are more common in natural areas, less maybe in your uh, home garden sure. that you might encounter and then you wouldn't want it in your home ca- garden. So mm-hmm. the big three I'm thinking of, um, kudzu, lesser celandine, and garlic mustard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I would say you're unlikely to see kudzu. <laughs> I mean, maybe you would. I never have seen it in a garden. It's really one that is more in forested mm-hmm. areas, especially forested areas that have, you know, had some kind of disturbance take place, like a road was run through yep. a previously intact forest area, something like that. Um, but yeah, like I'm sure everyone or a lot of people are familiar with kudzu as as an introduced species that was brought in specifically for erosion control. And they planted, you know, acres and acres and acres of kudzu. And before they realized, oh, it's not a good, (laughs) this is not a good thing. A little too successful, but yes. So kudzu, I've seen it in my area in particular at um school sites which is kind of shocking Mm. to me and i feel like it's being moved from site to site maybe on the mowing equipment the landscaping equipment Mm. um because it's on the banks of some of their playgrounds and things but not in the surrounding neighborhoods and that really concerns me yeah 
Huh. Yeah, that's definitely one that if you do see it and it's new to you, that that's one that I would be very concerned about um, mm-hmm. because that can become a, a problem very, very quickly, especially, like I said, in a forested area. Um, for the other two that you mentioned, for garlic mustard and lesser celandine, my observation is that these are really floodplain plants mm-hmm. for the most part. So they, so a floodplain is an ecology that is constantly disturbed because it's always being washed by floodwaters. Um, and these are two plants that, especially lesser celandine, that you really see. Like if you go and walk along the Potomac, you see this all all through the understory, and. Same with garlic mustard. I think garlic mustard may be a little bit more upland, but in any case, like both of those, I think are very much adapted to kind of floodplain disturbance. I think they like it a little bit more moist. And both of those, I would say, depending on like the scale of the quote unquote infestation, they can be like spot treated with herbicide and just knocked back in that way. And they're also um, they're also evergreen during the winter. So they're e- very easy to spot during the winter time. And I actually, I confess I'm not sure whether or not it's very effective to treat them with herbicide at that point in their life cycle. But if it, if it was, I would say that would be a great time to go through and, and find them because there's not much else that's green. Yeah. I saw a local park study recently that lesser celandine Um, the only time for applying pesticide is right at its early blooming stage that that's when it's, it'll take it in. That's particularly roundup that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing that was effective and it was a very short window of time. So applying it, it does have that waxy thick leaf, Mm -hmm. um, that you talked about on Vinca. So same, it's very pesticide resistant otherwise, but at that time of year when it's leafing out and, you know, just blooming, it's taking it back to the roots, which mm-hmm. would absorb the herbicide. And that's kind of your only window yeah. aside from, you know, then hand digging and smothering might be your other techniques for that one. Right. Garlic mustard, we talked about eating your weeds. So they have, <laughs> you know, they'll have local right. garlic festival pulling um, garlic, not garlic festival, garlic, uh, wild garlic and... Uh, this one uh, for the garlic mustard festival pullings and they'll even like do a weighing contest and then mm. make pesto out of it afterwards have you yeah, ever that's... tried that maddie i, as, as I have food? not mm-hmm. that's actually a really smart idea because that is the perfect time to eat it is before it goes to seed mm-hmm. because that's when it's not too you know doesn't get too uh pungent um mm-hmm. So the best time to to do your your eating of the weeds is actually the best time ecologically as well. But don't eat the lesser celandine. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Just the garlic mustard. <laughs> but it's pretty easy to tell the difference. Like it doesn't smell like garlic. Mm-hmm. You know <laughs> exactly. Pull off a leaf, crush it in your hand. You'll pretty right. much know garlic mustard. Right. Then it's all in the name, right there. Very distinctive. <laughs> so, um, how can our listeners get in contact with you, Maddie? Um, well, you can go to Casey Tree's website. If you go to caseytrees.org slash plant slash ecological hyphen gardens, um, that is the best way if you want to schedule a consult with us um, to talk about a native garden. Um, you can also go to our website and click on plant and there's like a whole variety of things in our drop down menu that you might be interested in our residential plantings, our community planting events, plantings at schools. Um, we also do pruning for very young trees. Um, and we offer a, a rebate if you plant a, a tree, like you go out and you buy a tree at a nursery um, and you plant it in your yard, you can get a rebate through us for that. So there's like a bunch of things that people might be interested in um, on our website. And then um, if you want to get in touch with me personally, because you want to talk about garlic mustard, um, my email is m-h-a-n-s-o-n at caseytrees.org. Great. Thank you so much, Maddie. And for those home gardeners out there battling those invasives, as we say, um, good luck and, you know, keep up the good fight. Yep. Thank you so much. Amir Adonis Plant Profile Amir Adonis, Adonis amirensis, is an early season ephemeral plant that appears and disappears in the late winter garden in a matter of weeks. The plant's foliage is lacy and ferny. 
It is native to China along the Amur River and in other parts of Asia, as well as eastern Siberia. Even though it's quite small, it still packs a punch with its bright yellow flowers in the bleak winter landscape, like its cousin in the ranunculus family, winter aconite. It is hardy to USDA zones 4 to 7. It prefers to grow in full to part sun and likes fertile, well-drained soils. It is pollinated by bees, flies, and beetles. It is deer resistant. There is an invasive lookalike, lesser celandine, Ficaria verna. However, that plant blooms later in the season and doesn't have the ferny foliage that Amir Adonis does. Amir Adonis is a popular rock garden plant and several cultivars have been bred in Japan. Amir Adonis, you can grow that. What's new in the garden this week? Well, I took advantage of one of the mild days of February to walk over to my community garden plot and check out how things are going. The garlic has emerged from the soil and so nice to see that. I pulled back a cover cloth from my pot of cilantro and saw that it is looking wonderful and I cut some sprigs off that to use in the kitchen. The arugula looking a little beaten up and flattened but still delicious and edible. I took a few leaves from that and I dug up one of the black round Spanish radishes that I had left in the ground last fall. Uh, it's kind of woody and tough, but I'll leave them in the ground to decompose and add back to the soil there. In garden tasks this week on our website and Facebook page at WDC Gardener on Twitter, we shared our winter blooming plants of choice and we talked about Daphne, winter jasmine, heath and heathers, so you can look at those on our social media. And I discovered on the Hyattsville Horticulture website, hyattsvillehorticulture.org, and that's the Hyattsville Horticultural Society, at the very top of the welcome page, they share the current soil temperature and the number of weeks before last frost. And I thought that was a great thing to do. So I would say bookmark HyattsvilleHorticulture.org and then you'll be able to see the current soil temperature and whether things are ready for planting out at that point. In local gardening events, two live in-person meetings you want to might want to attend include the Tacoma Horticultural Club's February 21st meeting, and that features a talk on overcoming fears of pruning with Josh Demers, Brookside Gardens horticulturist that is in downtown Tacoma Park, Maryland, near the Washington, D.C. border, being held at the historic Tacoma building at 7328 Carroll Avenue. You can find out more about that at the Tacoma Hort Dot org website and that meeting is free and open to all and then on monday february 26th the silver spring garden club is meeting featuring a talk on paradise under glass with guest speaker and author ruth ruth cassinger and that starts at 7 30 p.m that is also free and open to all that takes place at brookside gardens in wheaton maryland and you can see details about that at silverspringgardenclub.com. Happy gardening! Get low maintenance alternative salons with the new book Ground Cover Revolution by Kathy Jets. Reducing the lawn is among the biggest trends in home ownership, with an endless stream of homeowners looking for an eco-friendly alternative to a traditional everyday grass lawn. In the last few years alone, over 23 million American adults converted part of the lawn to a natural landscape and now are looking to do even more. The biggest challenge to adopting this new ideal of the perfect lawn is knowing how and when to replace your turf and which plants are the best ones for the job. Ground Cover Revolution is here with all the answers you need. Included are 40 in-depth profiles of plants that are perfect choices for replacing a grass lawn. There are options for sun, for shade, for dry and wet sites, and for various climates around the globe. There are choices that bloom, options that are evergreen, and selections that are deer-resistant. 
Author Kathy Jentz has also included an incredibly useful chart that gives you all the details on each of the 40 choices for quick reference and to make your ground cover selection process even easier. Whether you want to replace the entire lawn or just reduce the amount of land dedicated to turf, Ground Cover Revolution will help you usher in a new and improved idea of what a beautiful lawn should be. Available at bookstores now and also at Quarto.com, where you can get 30% off using discount code GARDENING30. In the new book, The Urban Garden by Kathy Jensen and Terry Spade, you'll find dozens of inspiring and creative ways to grow flowers, shrubs, vegetables, herbs, and other plants in small spaces and with a limited budget. Whether you want to grow on a balcony, rooftop, front stoop, or a tiny urban patio, turn your growing dreams into reality and build a gorgeous and unique garden that showcases your personal style while still being functional and productive. With the ingenious ideas and resourceful tactics found here, you'll be maximizing yields and beauty from every square inch of your space while also making a lush outdoor living area area you'll crave spending time in. Whether you're growing edible plants or beautiful flowers, the 101 amazing growing ideas found in the urban garden will turn your tiny urban yard into a treasure trove of green you'll be proud to share with family and friends. Buy your copy today at your local retail bookseller or order it online now at amazon.com or bookshop.org. This is Christy Page with Green Prints on composting with Paul the Opossum. And am I really composting or just feeding the wildlife? So I'm very late to composting. For years, it was something that I considered doing but never quite got around to. There always seemed to be a reason. The kids were too young, so having one more thing to do in a day was overwhelming. Or the yard was too small, where would I put it? And then what about winter? Do we just skip it? We bought a house on over an acre about seven years ago, and by then the kids were teenagers. I was running out of reasons not to jump on the composting bandwagon. Yet still, I hesitated. We have three dogs, and they love to munch on the peels from cucumbers and the ends of carrots, and I kept rationalizing that it really wouldn't be that much, so why compost? Each spring, we would head to the garden supply store and grab fertilizer. It did help our little seedlings sprout and grow. We would lovingly sprinkle some more on throughout the summer. My husband and I finally paused and said, this is why we should compost. Instead of throwing stuff away to go buy it, in a sense, we might as well make our own. So this year, we decided to start our own compost pile. We picked a back edge of the property, figuring that it was out of the way of the dog's play area, but convenient for collecting to spread in the garden. We began adding our organic materials and started waiting for the composting process to happen. After a couple weeks, it seemed like our compost pile was shrinking instead of growing. One evening, as my husband was depositing our daily scraps, he started an animal. It scurried into the bushes before he could get a good look. He came back into the house all excited. It seems that our pile was diminishing because something was snacking on it. My husband instantly started speculating on what the creature could have been. We get many visits from foxes, squirrels, bears, and even a bobcat. He decided that what we really needed was a camera set up so that we could catch the culprit in the act. The very next day, he excitedly mounted a trail camera to a nearby tree and made sure that it was at a good angle to capture the compost pile. It was now another waiting game, but this one did not take as long. The following morning, we logged into the app and were greeted with a variety of photos. My husband was hoping for a good picture of a fox or a deer, but what he got? An opossum. Night after night, we were greeted by images of an opossum snacking on our compost pile. At first, my husband was disappointed, and then he started seeing the benefits of having Paul the opossum around. Opossums greatly help to keep other pests out of the yard and garden, including ticks. And living in the country, this is a huge help to us. Since then, we have seen a deer, a fox, and a few other creatures on the trail camera. But we are so happy to see new images of Paul each morning. Our compost pile might not be growing, but it is helping our garden in other ways. By keeping Paul around and happy, we're hoping to keep other pests at bay. Well, this has been Christy Page with GreenPrints.com. Have a great day.
Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to podcasters.spotify.com slash pod slash show slash garden DC. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.blogspot.com. Thank you. You can find and follow Washington Gardener on Twitter, slash X, Instagram, and Pinterest at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook at Washington Gardener Magazine. Please take a moment to rate and review this podcast on Spotify and Apple. Open the Spotify or Apple app, search for Garden DC, check on the rate button, and select five stars.